Hey, good to have you with us, our Elevate Online family, from wherever you're joining us from in the world. And uh, it's great to, to have you, especially those of you, as Jordan mentioned earlier, those of you joining us for the first time. We're excited to have you here and uh, on the journey together. It's nearly halfway through 2020. I know, that's like, what? Yeah. Uh, early June here, and um, maybe like me, many of you uh, started 2020 with some big lofty goals, some big dreams, some big resolutions, some big ideas, and uh, then March, COVID. <laughs> Reminds me of one of Mike Tyson's famous quotes, everyone has a plan until he gets punched in the face. And COVID has felt a bit like a global punch in the face. Um, things that we've taken for granted for probably most of our lives have been taken away from us, at least temporarily. Things like just, you know, physically socializing in homes and in restaurants and so on, coffee shops, um, playing sport, watching sport, uh, temporarily taken from us, uh, travel, going on holidays and so on, temporarily taken from us. So the landscape uh, became pretty barren in, in effect. Um, but on the theme of quotes, uh, Winston Churchill famously said, never let a good crisis go to waste. Um, and I'm looking at people's landscapes um, that have a less crowded, a less uh, busy than maybe that would normally be. Um, Obviously, except if you've started baking banana bread um, and or uh, taken on homeschooling duties, which, by the way, well done if you've taken on homeschooling duties. Uh, by now, you will probably have learned that recess was uh, created for teachers, not for students. So there's that. But while we're in this season of the landscape having less options, taking Winston Churchill's advice, never waste a good crisis, I, I, we think it's a great opportunity for us to just uh, push pause or essentially some of things have been pushed pause for us and look at what's important. Really take a deep dive into what really matters in our, in our lives and what things we can learn, what things we can change, what things we can improve on going forward. So today we're launching a brand new series called How to Not Be Your Own Worst Enemy. And it's intentionally a very clickbaity uh, title um, because it uses this incredibly strong word, enemy. Uh, and when we think of enemies, I think, you know, most of us, our thoughts would gravitate towards how wars begin. That one country or one uh, alliance of countries versus another country um, consider themselves enemies for whatever reasons and go to war. Um, and yet it's actually possible for you and for me to be our own worst enemy. And before you scoff and before you kind of excuse yourself and think, well, there's no way I'd ever be my own worst enemy, let me point out, you've probably seen other people be their worst enemy. See, if the, if the purpose of an enemy is to sabotage somebody else, then being your own worst enemy looks like self-sabotage. And you've probably seen people self-sabotage. Maybe they've self sabotaged their business or their career. Maybe you've seen people be their own worst enemy when it comes to their marriage, be their own worst enemy when it comes to their finances, be their own worst enemy when it comes to their health. And by looking through the lens of what maybe you and I have seen other people do as far as self-sabotage goes, it might actually be a little bit easier to identify times when we've self-sabotaged when we've been our own worst enemy, when it comes to studies, when it comes to relationships, when it comes to finances, health, business, career. Um, so this is a series, how to not be your own worst enemy. Because if one thing I know about you, and it's true of me as well, you've been involved in all of your bad decisions. <laughs> I mean, there's circumstances that are put on us that we can't control that cause our lives uh, to sometimes take a negative turn. Yet bad decisions that we've made 
we've made. No getting around that. And this series isn't about rubbing our nose in it. This series is about us um, highlighting the fact that it's possible to move from being your own worst enemy to becoming your own best friend, to move from somebody who by various decisions and actions and patterns might be inclined to self-sabotage, to actually be somebody in your own life that causes promotion, causes forward movement, causes improvement and advancement. On a bit of a quote roll here uh, today, um, so let me uh, share a quote uh, from one of the characters in The Office, Dwight Schrute. Uh, I'm not sure if you're all an Office fan here, but this is one of his famous quotes. Whenever I'm about to do something, I think, would an idiot do that? And if they would, I do not do that thing. So let me paraphrase that and as it might be a guiding principle for our new series, and, and it might goes something like this. Whenever I'm about to do something, I think, would my enemy want me to do that? And if they would, I do not do that thing. I want you to join me on a little bit of a theater of the mind here. Take you on a little bit of a hypothetical. And the hypothetical, it goes something like this. For you to hypothetically and me hypothetically invite our worst enemy, and, and by the way, you might know who that is, or if you don't really have a worst enemy, let's just pretend you do. Invite them to follow you around and, and give them the brief that their job in following you around for a, a week or a month, their, their job is whenever you're about to make a certain decision or whenever you're about to take a course of action, that their job is to actually give you advice, but give you advice from the perspective of your worst enemy, someone who's determined to see your life sabotaged. So let's say, for example, uh, you're online shopping. And uh, there you go, you you found this thing, it's on special, you know, but you, you don't know if you can afford it. And it kind of looks a little like something you already have. So you turn to your worst enemy for advice. What do you think I should do? Which I don't recommend you do this. This is hypothetical. And they might say to you, well, yeah, you already have one that does everything that this one does, but look, hey, this one's newer. And, and what's more, I mean, I know it's expensive and I know you can't really afford it, but look, buy it. And when it arrives, if you decide you don't want it, just donate it. And you'd be thinking, what? But that's the point. That's the, that would be typical of the sort of advice your enemy might give you. Or, or let's say you're thinking about doing something that, that quite obvious is not a wise thing for you to do. And before you do it, you turn to your enemy and you say, well, do, do you think I should do it? And your enemy would likely say, yeah, of course, go ahead and do it. Just don't tell anyone. Thankfully, we have access to a voice that, unlike our worst enemy, actually has our best interests at heart. And this is the voice of our conscience. This is this internal voice that God's imprinted in us that has the capacity that when we're approaching something that's not wise, when we're approaching something that's less than God's best, when we're about to do something or say something or, or not do something that we should perhaps do, this is the, this is the, the voice that says, uh, uh, uh. this is the voice that goes ding. This is, the, this is the voice that sets off a warning light on our dashboard. This is the voice that, that, that should and, and has the capacity to create some tension in us. That is, we're leading up to this thing that, that's not God's best for us, that we're leading up, this, leading up to, to do this thing or thinking about doing this thing that's not wise or saying this thing that's not wise. This, it, it, it's, it creates a tension in us. And the big idea I want to highlight for today is that when that tension arises in you, push pause and pay attention to that tension. 
you know, I want to get in the way back machine and take us back to a, a, a moment in history, a, an event in history um, that involves two reasonably well-known characters, and I'll come to that in a second. What I want you to do is if you've got your uh, second device handy, uh, open up the Bible app and uh, join me in uh, the old part of the Bible. It's a uh, a book called First Samuel and uh, chapter 24. I'm going to start from verse 1. First Samuel chapter 24. We're also going to have it on the, the screen here as well. Uh, before I do, let me give you the backstory. And, and by the way, I'm, I, I need you to concentrate right now because I'm about to give you nearly three decades of history in under three minutes. Okay, so buckle up. Here we go. Uh, the two main characters that I want to draw our attention to and that, that, that form the part of history that we're going to drop into are uh, characters named Saul and David. Now, Saul was the first king of Israel. And David, you think, oh, is that the David from David and Goliath? Yes, it is. Uh, Saul and David, David from David and Goliath's fame. Now, Saul's the king of Israel at this point in history, the first ever king of Israel. Um, and David had kind of... Uh, rose to prominence by actually defeating Goliath, the story that many of us are familiar with. Uh, and when he, when he did defeat Goliath, um, you know, he, he got Saul's attention. And uh, Saul brought David into his inner circle. Uh, Saul started entrusting him with greater influence in the military. Uh, Saul actually uh, married off one of his own daughters to David. So now David was the son-in-law to the king. Um, and... Uh, continue to have success in the military um, to the point where as his, as his success grew, as his pr prominence grew, uh, that's David, uh, Saul started to see David as a threat. And so Saul um, decided that the best course of action was for David to be killed. So his plan was that he would, and he started doing this, started sending David on increasingly risky missions to uh, confront and wage war against their enemies, the Philistines, in the hope that the Philistines would actually kill David, do the dirty work for him. Well, uh, that didn't work out. Uh, David didn't die at the hands of the Philistines. And so Saul figured out the, the next best course of action was for him to take matters into his own hands. So he effectively put a bounty out on David, um, which David found out about and in response David fled and David went into hiding uh, became an outlaw really Saul then employed spies to be out in the wild looking for David and David was hiding and trying to keep a step ahead of the spies um, and then word got around the the, the region uh, that David was an outlaw and other outlaws decided to come seek him out and join him. And over a period of time, uh, this uh, band of brigands, this, this outlaw army actually formed around David. Um, amazing. One thing that's important to insert into this event is that long before David defeated Goliath, long before we find David on the run from the king of Israel, his father-in-law. While David was actually a young boy, God had sought him out through a prophet and handpicked him to, in his future, become the king of Israel, which at this point in history was not a position vacant. It was Saul on that throne. So... David's on the run, Saul's on the hunt. This is what's written in 1 Samuel chapter 24, starting at verse 1. When Saul came back after dealing with the Philistines, he was told, David is now in the wilderness of En Gedi. So Saul took three companies, which is three would have been about 3,000 men. Kind of excessive, but that's how intent he was on eradicating David from uh, his uh, world and the best he could find in all of Israel. So 3,000 elite soldiers and he set out in search of David and his men in the region of wild goat rocks. He came to some sheep pens along the road and there was a cave there and Saul went in to 
relieve himself. Yes, that means what it means in the original Hebrew, the New Greek, and uh, I believe it's the only reference in the entire Bible of someone going to the toilet. But that's it. So this is what we find. Uh, Saul would have been in this big convoy, this big caravan with his 3,000 elite soldiers. Um, he was on a mule uh, in this convoy. There would have been many other uh, people involved in this convoy for supply chain management and, and catering and, and so on. And uh, for all of them, if they had needed a bathroom break, they just have to kind of step off the road, do their business and, and step back in. But when you're the king, you don't go to the toilet in public and you have the power to tell the whole convoy, stop, I'm going to go and relieve myself. So that's what had happened. And this region was full of caves. So, you know, it's quite just they stop the caravan. Saul finds the nearest cave uh, ready to do what he needed to do. And then it's recorded David and his men were huddled far back in the same cave. What? <laughs> given the number of caves in the region, given the fact that David, who had heard that Saul was coming for him, him and his men chose just one of those caves. The fact that Saul just had needed a nature break and happened to, to need it at the point where the caravan was passing by this particular cave and chose therefore the, 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 the most convenient cave to do what he had to do. And it happened to be the same cave that David was hiding. The, the mathematical probability of that happening is almost zero. And so you got to think and, and, and would be uh, right to conclude in this moment that God had actually orchestrated this. He'd orchestrated the entire thing so that an innocent David who was on the run for crimes he hadn't committed was going to have his hunter, his enemy, his arch nemesis actually handed to him on a platter for David to actually take matters into his own hands and turn the tables and instead of being the hunted in that moment, he could become the hunter. And so it's no surprise to, to read that David's men whispered to him, can you believe it? This is the day God was talking about when he said, I'll put your enemy in your hands and you can do whatever you want with him. So you don't even need to read on from here to, to, to know that the obviously what happened next is that David advanced from the back of the cave, snuck up on Saul, chopped off his head, walked out of the front of the cave, stood in front of the, the caravan, the convoy, and the elite soldiers, held Saul's head up, and announced himself as the new king, king of Israel, to which the, the people obviously uh, were, were grateful for, because they were on the verge of a civil war. Uh, and in this moment, David had taken the opportunity, beheaded Saul, avoided the civil war, and, and become the, the king of Israel, which, which uh, people had learned was something that God wanted for him anyway. Problem is, that isn't what happened. And here's what actually happened. Quiet as a cat, David crept up and cut off a piece of Saul's royal robe. Immediately, he felt guilty. Highlight that. Immediately, he felt guilty. Immediately, there was a uh, uh, uh. And he said to his men, God forbid that I should have done this to my master, God's anointed. That I should so much as raise a finger against him. He's God's anointed. And David held his men in check with these words and wouldn't let them pounce on Saul either. And Saul got up and left the cage and went on down the road. It looks like his men wouldn't have understood and didn't understand why David missed that opportunity, that God had delivered Saul right to his, literally to his doorstep, and he didn't take advantage of it. It would have made no sense to them. 
uh, to the point where they wanted to say, well, if you're not going to do it, we'll do it. And David said, no, I don't, none of us are going to do it. But what we learn from this and the big takeaway we learn from David is that, yes, he was going to become king, but not like this. That it was the right robe, but it was the wrong approach. That just because we can do something doesn't mean we should do something. Just because something's possible doesn't mean it's God's best for us. And this is, I, I, I reasonably consistently come back to highlighting a very vital principle that I push back against that I call the sliding doors theology. This, this, th there's, there's people that have an idea and look, without any judgment, you may have said this or thought this yourself and you may have come in contact with other people that have said or thought this. The, the idea that if a door is open, God must have opened it and he must want us to go through it. Versus if a door is closed, well, then that's a sign that God doesn't want us to go through that at all. And yet here we had David in a situation where the door was very much open. And yet he knew by listening to the voice of his conscience that he wasn't meant to go through it. That he was going to become king, but that's not the sort of king he wanted to be. He wanted to be a king based on character. He wanted to become a king that was unequivocally a king purely because of calling, not because of manipulation. In fact, in Western c culture, we have a saying, the end justifies the means. And David would say to you, no, actually, in some cases, the end doesn't justify the means, that this wasn't the way God wanted it to happen. And so for us, the convenient thing isn't always the wise thing. The available thing isn't always the right thing. And, and, and that instead of listening to our enemy, especially if that enemy is us, that, that, that the practice that will benefit from developing is develop the voice of our conscience. And we do that by reading God's word consistently. We do that by listening to God's Holy Spirit and allowing him to shape out our conscience and highlight our conscience and clarify our conscience. And we, and we see our conscience develop its potency um, by listening to the voice of trusted, wise people who have fruit in their life that we actually want to move in that direction as well. And as our conscience develops, that when we're coming up to those moments that God would want us to know, do not enter, do not do that, that we would hear the uh, 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 and when we hear that, we would pay attention to the tension. Now, this is a three-week series and uh, each week, we're going to give you all some homework, a little bit of uh, a little bit of grunt work, but in design in a, in a way and to take the opportunity for us to take a deep dive into how not to become your own worst enemy. Um, so the way we've, we're doing that is very simple. The delivery mechanism is, is going to come right to you. Uh, get our Elevate Church AU app, which you can get on Apple and Google. Um, and uh, in there, you'll find Elevate Group Notes. And each of these three weeks for the series, we're going to actually be publishing our Elevate group notes. Now, our Elevate groups are groups here in Perth metro area that meet uh, regularly uh, in homes and coffee shops and so on and so forth. Obviously, met more on Zoom the last three months than that. Um, but you don't have to be in the, in the Perth metro area uh, to access this. And so those uh, there's going to be notes each week in our Elevate group notes section. And you can access them and you can work through them on your own. Uh, you can work through them with your spouse, your family, maybe get some friends around wherever you are. And I want to encourage you each of the weeks uh, to get in there and, and work through them and allow God to use this time and this space and this series so that all of us can better learn how not to be our own worst enemy.